Hi everyone. Uh, if you can all hear me, we're just about to get going to begin with. I'm going to invite uh, Matthew McGrady up to say a few words to you all. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for coming along today. My name is Matthew, and I would like to welcome you to this event right here, right now. I would like to start by thanking Ulster University for, host, for hosting us here today in this amazing new building that is the University's Belfast campus. A special thanks to Duncan Morrow, who is sponsoring our event. We will hear from Duncan soon. The event today has been organised by seven organisations working with children and young people across Northern Ireland. They are the Children's Law Centre, the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, Include Youth, Angel Eyes, the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People, the Northern Ireland Youth Assembly, and FOIPIC, the voice of young people in care. I am a young rep at FOIPIC. Earlier this year, I travelled with young people from these organisations to Geneva in Switzerland to talk to the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child. We told them about how children's rights are respected here. You will hear more about our trip and what we talked to the committee about later. The reason we are here today is to talk to you, our peers, about what we told the committee and what the committee wrote in their report about children's rights here. There will be another event like this next month for professionals, policy makers and practitioners. So what we discuss today will be raised at that meeting. It is important that they know our opinions and ideas and that they take our views into account when making decisions. The right to be heard is just one of our rights that is set out in the UNCRC, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Our government has to make sure that our rights are respected and protected. Every few years, the UN Committee responsible for children's rights looks at how different governments are doing this in each of the countries. The committee then publishes a report including recommendations that is called the concluding observations. Recently, the UN committee has published a report about how our government is doing. That is what we're here to talk about today. This afternoon, you will hear from some of, some of the young people who took part in the workshops at the UN. Then you will have an opportunity to talk about the report, the concluding observations, with others at your table. In these discussions, you may come up with some questions. At the end, there will be a panel made up of Lindsay Farrell, Department of Education, Assistant Chief Constable Ryan Herdison of the PSNI, Gareth Johnson, the Executive Office, Chris Quinn, Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People, who will be answering these questions. If you do have a question, make sure it is noted down at your table so it can be put to the panel. Finally, a reminder that this is a safe space for you to voice your opinions and ideas. All comments are important, so please respect everyone's contribution. And please only share information about yourself that you are comfortable sharing. Everyone owns their own story, and it's up to you how much of yours you share with others. Now, I would like to introduce Professor Duncan Morrow, Professor of Politics and Director of Community Engagement at Ulster University, who has sponsored today's event. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew, very much for that. That was a great introduction. Um, you thank me, but I have to thank you. This is brilliant. I, this, these kind of things are what I do in my job. My job is <clears throat> called big title director of community engagement, which basically means how do you make sure that the university is relevant to people's lives uh, inside and outside, and the things that happen here are things which are important for everybody, but also that people in the whole community feel that they can come in here and find uh, something to do. So uh, the first thing for us is getting people in the doors and doing things which matter. And universities, uh, two things about them, I suppose you should say is, one is um, at the core of universities is always young people, actually. Uh, young people are the blood, lifeblood of this place. Uh, if we didn't have people coming through here every year, then we would die. So it's really, really a place where young people aren't the edge of the thing. They are actually at the center of, of everything that we do. And the second thing we do is try to talk about and research and write about and teach um, things that are important to people. 
uh, whether that's computing or digital or learning how to draw, do art even in, in, a, in a meaningful way, but also uh, all sorts of subjects, including law and rights and politics and all of these things that you're here to talk about today. They are the stuff we want to talk about, and we need to make sure that the right people are in the room talking about the right things. And actually, today I have the feeling that is exactly the kind of thing we're doing. So my thanks are to you, Matthew, and to all of you for turning up here, because um, this will be part of our story, but this is now becoming a place where genuinely people start to come. And I hope that it's not the first or the last time you're in here. If it is the first time, this is the room uh, that uh, President Biden did his talks in and he came here in uh, April. This uh, stage was built like uh, overnight by the Americans to, and we kept it because it was the same, matched perfectly with down here. But the, uh, we uh, have everybody, I suppose, that just says we try to get everybody in here right from uh, you know, people who have never been in here before and might never have thought it was for them right up to President Biden. So you're all very welcome. The other thing to say for me is that um, I hope that you find other things to do here. This isn't the last time. Uh, there will be all sorts of events going on here. At the, at the very basic, you get Starbucks for two pounds downstairs. So even if that's all you do, you can come in. And th th these bits here, some of them you have to have a pass to get into them or you have to. But right at the bottom, you can always come in every day and it's an open space. So if you, if you want to come and use it for a place just to hang out, that's also great. And we're delighted to have you. Anyway, I should shut up. I have to tell you a couple of things, um, just by way of the, the kind of hygiene stuff. If there is a fire alarm, it's not a test. There's no test that is expected today. So you just do what you're told. It, it'll give you a whole instructions and you'll be asked to leave. When you do leave, you just follow the green signs as normal and that'll take you safely down outside and you just go outside. The toilets are, the women's and girls' toilets are on this side men's boys toilets are on this side and there's a disabled toilet on this side as well so um, you should be able to get that and um, if I hope that you have as good a conversation as you started obviously you had a great time in Geneva and these things about rights are really really important so it's great for us to know that they're in safe hands thank you very much I would like to invite Jack Dalzell up to say a few words. Hello everyone, I'm Jack Dalzell and I'm here with the Northern Iron Youth Forum. And um, as, as the slide hopefully says, I'm here to try and set the scene and hopefully explain what the UNCRC is and how the report, reporting process works. So yes, the UNCRC, well, it came into effect in 1990 and was signed and ratified by all countries of the UN, bar one, which was the USA, who decided not to ratify it, um, which basically means that they're not bound by international law to uphold these rights. So all of the, um, all of the rights are equal. So uh, like in my, everyone has their own opinion, and in my opinion, I might think that some rights are more important than others. But under the law, all the rights are equal and all the rights have to be upheld. And they, under Article 2, they're entitled to everyone, no matter your race, your sexuality, they're entitled to everyone, and there's no discrimination. And some of these rights include the right to life, the right to survive and develop, the right to freedom, thought, conscience, and religion. So you're able to believe whatever you want to believe. No one can tell you what your opinion is, or if your opinion's wrong, and you can believe um, whatever you want. Article 24, the best health care possible. And then Article 12, Everyone has to respect young people's views. No one can say that a young person's views is wrong and you're allowed to have your own opinion. And hopefully that's what we're here to do today, to get your opinion on the concluding observations, which I'll talk about in a second. And Article 42, the knowledge of rights. So hopefully by the end of today, you might have a bit more knowledge of your rights. So onto the reporting procedure. So um, as I says, if a, um, if a country has ratified the UNCRC, they're bound by international law. And this is done by an 18-person committee of experts who um, basically monitor each country in how they're upholding the UNCRC. So these are seven-year cycles, which start by um, non-government organizations and child rights defenders submitting reports. And this happens about one to two years before the actual um, session happens. And these reports are basically um, outlining what the, 
issues are happening in the country with the UNCRC and what needs to be done. Three months later, there'll be a list of issues prior to reporting, which is um, like given to the um, NGOs by the committee. So this is, this is given to the government and the government have to respond within a year um, on what, um, what they're gonna do about these issues. And then other reports by the NGOs are then also submitted. Um, and then this year, at the end of 2022, there was also a survey completed by 1,000 young people, which was also put in with the report. So then we get to the pre-sessions. The pre-session this year happened in February 2023. And this included a children's meeting, which um, children were able to submit presentations to the committee on what they think needs. Um, this was from young people in Northern Ireland and from all over the UK in an hour long meeting where they got to put forward what their issues are and what needs to be done for young people. And then there's the pre-session. So non-government organisations, children's and children's commissioners and some young people sit and are asked questions by this committee on what is happening basically in the country and if everything's going well with the UNCRC. And then they give information to the committee and if it is going well, if it isn't going well, and what needs to be done better. So this is to inform the committee of the issues that affect young people in Northern Ireland and the UK. So then with this information, you go to the, se the session, and the session, all this, um, all this process leads up to the session, which happened this year in May of 2023, where the committee um, puts forward all these findings to the UK government, and the UK government goes to Geneva and is represented by civil servants, and all the issues is presented to them. And they're basically asked questions and grilled on what they're going to do and what needs to happen. And there are, um, those questions and all the information then come together in a, in a concluding observation, which happened this year in 2023. Which is basically, this is why what we're here to discuss today. We're here to discuss the concluding observations and what your opinions are on the concluding observations. So the concluding observations, I'll outline a few of them. So, um, the, UN, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child said that these rights should be protected in law because at the minute the UK government have not um, enshrined the rights in law so we in the country can't go forward to court and say my, law, my rights aren't upheld because it's not enshrined in the law and the UNCRC says that these need to be enshrined in law. Other things like um, needs, can, they're going to consult young people on lowering the voting age and preventing stop and search mechanisms on under 16s. This process then repeats every five to six years because obviously issues come up and issues go away and just seeing how things go on through, um, throughout the years and making sure they continue to uphold the rights. So, thank you. Now we'd like to invite uh, Chris Quinn up to say a few words to you all. Thank you, um, and thank you Matthew, Duncan and Jack. Um, Jack, that was a really well executed explanation of a very complicated uh, process, so it saves me having to explain it, so thanks very much. Um, and just to introduce myself, I'm Chris Quinn, I'm the Northern Ireland Commissioner for Children and Young People, and this is my very first event locally um, as Commissioner. So I took up the post on Monday, I flew out to Brussels, to meet other commissioners from across Europe. And this event is so important to me because it gives me an opportunity to introduce myself to you and to listen to your views. So over the next eight years, I intend in bringing what you say today and, and beyond today into my day-to-day my -day work. So my, new, my job as commissioner is to promote and to safeguard the rights of children and young people. Um, and I really want to work hard to listen to your lived experiences and to try and make changes. Today's event is about the UN concluding observations, which Jack has explained. Um, and for me, um, the concluding OBS are so important. Um, having been in Geneva with young people in February, um, and have supported young people who went out in May, um, I can put my hand on my heart and say that the committee listened to young people, and the feedback that we got was that their views 
that they felt that their views were acted upon. And you can see that in the concluding OBS. So you're going to look at these today. Um, but I'm really glad that issues that we've been campaigning on for a long time, such as mental health, LGBTQ rights, knowledge of rights and poverty all feature in there. There are also um, issues specific to Northern Ireland, which the committee highlighted, which is really important for us. And one of them was about the withdrawal of the Northern Ireland budget, which you might have heard about in the news. Um, and there's also issues in there, such as the, the impact and influence the paramilitary still have on our communities and the need for a Bill of Rights. And Jack alluded to the need for the, the Convention to be enshrined in law. So we would hope that through a Bill of Rights, that would be one way uh, that we could work towards that. There's also other issues in the concluding OBS that are really important. There's probably too many to list, but just some that I wanted to highlight were things like the, the, the rise in youth homelessness that we've seen, um, the barriers faced by young people who are seeking asylum or who are refugees, as well as age-based discrimination, which we've been lobbying on for quite a long time. Um, but it's important for us now to lobby government and make sure that they, they put in place, they put in place laws and they change the way that they work um, to protect your rights. And that's a big part of my job. So my job and the role of my office now will be to hold government the account. So all of that said, for me, this event today is so important. This is where the work starts. We've been to Geneva, we've presented, the UN committee have written back to the UK government and we will write to the Northern Ireland Assembly when they get back round the table, not if, um, and we will hold the end of the account. But today is about hearing your views. So it's really important that you participate and, you know, tell us what you feel safe in telling us. Um, because after today, it's our intention, as all of these organisations in front of you, including my own, to, to try and represent your voices as best that we can. So I'll stop talking. And just a massive thank you for having me here today. Um, and I'll be here all day. And please make yourself known and... Um, yeah, let's let's engage as much as we can so that I can do my, my job as best that I can in representing your views. Thank you so much. Now I've got to invite up Ruby Campbell to give her experience. Hi everyone, um, I'm Ruby from the Children's Law Centre. So on the 18th of May 2023, I and a group of young people's representatives from Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland arrived at Pally Wilson, which is the headquarters of the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, to speak to the Committee on the Rights of the Child, who that afternoon would be investigating the British government's policies regarding young people. Leading up to that day, I knew exactly what I wanted to say to the Committee. A few short weeks earlier, the Department of Education had announced a new 2023-2024 budget, making staggering cuts to free school meals, extended schools programmes, mental health support and integrated education efforts. For many of us, accessing these resources is vital for our well-being and protection. This was a clear threat to the rights of young people across the country. I spoke directly to the committee of my concerns. My fears that the axing of happy, healthy minds and the ludicrously long CAMS waiting list would mean adequate mental health provisions would become for many of us all but an impossibility. That dramatically decreased funding for free breakfast for impoverished children meant that students were coming to school hungry. And to my delight, the committee responded, highlighting the issues to the British government and questioning both the morality and legality of such drastic measures. They had heard me and agreed with me. It felt incredible for my concerns to be truly recognised and understood on such a scale and I'm so proud to have been a part of this amazing, unique experience. Several weeks later, the committee posted their concluding observations from their sessions with the government, and again, much to my delight, in bold was withdraw the Northern Ireland budget for 2023. Finally, the damage this budget would do to young people was acknowledged, and it was clear our contributions made a powerful impact. Thank you. Now we're going to invite up Olivia Bryson. Woo! 
Good afternoon, my name is Olivia Bryson and the issue that I presented to the UN Committee was Northern Ireland's lack of government. Speaking with the committee members was a genuinely rewarding experience. They took the time to listen to every issue that was presented to them and took a complete interest. I really felt like my voice was heard and considered. Following the meeting with the committee, concluding observations have been made as well as recommendations to government. Many, however, many of these, however, will not progress in Northern Ireland due to our failing executive. Since 1998, there has been a promise of an NI-specific Bill of Rights. This has not yet been achieved. One of the UN Committee's recommendations is to enact a Bill of Rights for Northern Ireland. This unfortunately cannot happen without a government. Our rights as children and young people are essential, yet the government in Northern Ireland cannot begin to discuss them due to their blatant refusal to sit in the Assembly. I am in a position of privilege to be aware and educated on my rights, however many children and young people are not. Many face discrimination based on their age, being thought of as lesser and less capable. Another one of the committee recommendations was to take legislative and other measures to ensure the protection of all children below 18 from discrimination on the grounds of their age and to address discriminatory stereotypes against children and promote a positive image of children as rights holders. Every child should know the rights they possess and every child should feel as if they are protected, valued and looked after in our society. Our government has neglected our children and young people through the suspension of government failing to recognise children and young people with legitimate rights. Legislation passed in the Northern Ireland Assembly should take into account what is in the best interest of a child or young person and what would benefit us. The UN Committee recommends that when revising the Assembly's budget, the 2023-24 to budget should be withdrawn and the Assembly should fully consider the equality and human rights implications for a new budget, taking all possible steps to mitigate any adverse impact on children's rights before issuing the revised budget. This way, children and young people's rights are at the forefront of decision making and their interests are fully considered and met. None of this can happen without an executive that is unwilling to sit and participate in these discussions. Recently, RSE has been a source of contention in Northern Ireland, with many having differ differing opinions on it. Young people are entitled to a comprehensive and holistic education regarding relationships and sexual education, and the executive should take this into account to ensure that child rights are protected. When the correct information is delivered in a safe way to children and young people, they are more likely to have a better understanding of themselves and what to do in many different situations. There are instances, however, when this is not the case and children and young people may require family planning services. However, this issue cannot be addressed without a government, an issue that affects almost every one of us in some way or another. Without these services, our safety as young people is compromised. The NI Assembly needs to be aware of how important access to these services are following the recommendation from the committee to ensure access for adolescent girls to an age-appropriate family planning service, affordable contraceptives and safe abortion and post-abortion care, particularly in Northern Ireland and the overseas territories. We as young people need these services and even the most basic education on them. As of July 2023, Stormont has been in a state of collapse for 41.5% of its existence. This figure will have inevit inevitably increased over these past months. Children and young people in Northern Ireland should have the chance to grow up with an effective, reliable and functional government, one that protects and promotes the rights and advocates on behalf of them. We as young people are not being provided with a substantial government and we do not have decision makers to count on. This is entirely unacceptable. Thank you. Now we inviting Zoe Harry up. Is for long. Um, everything's been really well explained before me and I do want that piano to start again. So um, I also went to Geneva in February along with the Children's Law Centre um, to also represent part of the NI delegation. Um, all I really hoped for before going was that the voices of all the youth in NI were kind of heard through all of ours because not everybody has the chance to go and even though we did represent kind of a broad range of youth in NI, you know, there are a lot, I was in a really privileged position to be able to go and speak. 
Um, I went kind of saying that all I hoped for was to impact at least one person because if one person wants to change, that could change everything for all youth in NI. If just one person in power, you know, gets maybe is impacted and it's just kind of kick-started to make a change. It's kind of like a domino effect to me. If I just affected one person positively, that could affect everybody positively. So that was kind of my goal. Um, I discussed RSE as well, uh, which is Relationship Sexual Education, how it should be mandatory in every educational setting. So, you know, um, basically not just, you know, the schools, public schools, private schools, educational settings for um, children with disabilities, youth detention centres. Um, it's not just applicable to one or the other. Um, and also age-appropriate information um, on respect and relationships, same-sex relationships, <coughs> consent, sexual reproductive rights, relationships and awareness of sexual abuse or exploitation. And I only focused on this because I feel like it covers such like a broad range. Relationships aren't only romantic, they're platonic. It's the relationship between young people in society, relationship between young people and adults in you know, positions of authority, parental relationships. So um, a lot of things I feel like it affected. As a result, um, which is what we're discussing today then, the concluding observations and recommendations, we got quite a strong response. Um, um, because the UK government have signed up to the UNCRC, they should technically abide by the recommendations, um, which is all that we really wanted was just for something to happen. Legislations just went through in Westminster to make sure the RSA is mandatory in NI, and the Department of Education have just issued a consultation on making RSA mandatory. So all that we really went to do was to make a change, and we see that it is happening now, and hopefully it follows up. So young people's voices do matter, and all you have to do is go talk and don't get interrupted by a piano. <laughs> I we'll just have a short video for you all here. Hi, my name is Heaven. I am the XEB of Belfast Includes. So when I think about my time in Geneva, I'm most proud of, first of all, being there because I never expected to be there and it was a big thing for me. I mean, to be heard my voice and then express what I want to say. So that was the most thing I was proud of. It was important for me to speak to the UN committee directly because you know what you want to ask and how to ask them. And I had the great group actually from Belfast. They all support me and give, like everyone has their own voice so we could actually express ourselves in there and speak to them directly and ask them questions that was very very important i think speaking directly to the un committee it will it was hard for me to see what kind of people the un committee want to do what kind of question they want to ask they take example from us and then everyone has their own questions so that was a good thing Um, my question was about asylum seekers, so I want to see in action, help them, especially the young people, unaccompanied young people um, with their mental health. There is a lot of issue around, a lot of people killing themselves, and it's so sad to see it, but um, in the, when we went in Geneva, there was the answer at that kind of question, and I was very disappointed. But I'm trying to see if they could do more and then help these young people. And then everyone actually deserves the right thing and everyone wants a better life. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. How are you doing? Um, Ehab, I think you all know by the time. I'm an ex uh, EBE in Balamina branch for Include Youth. The most proud when I think about my time in Geneva. So I'll take the meeting we have done for one day to go to the UN committee. So everybody in the room picked up a specific one, a specific problem 
voice, I like to say them, to be honest, to raise tomorrow to the UN committee. That's going to be raised, raised by them to the UK government. And the reason we did that, we tried to gather as much voices as we could. And through the meeting, we could just, if anyone ask about them, we could just add the others in the middle. And we recorded like almost Northern Ireland got the most race problems, to be honest, that day in this meeting after. So that was like the best one because it is the best teamwork I've ever seen. And I still like proud of to be a part of it. Which is so good. So for the UN committee, it was good because we had a chance to speak about our minds, things and the people stories without saying names and so they get understanding of the point of view we're speaking from so we're not speaking depends on our opinions no there's facts there's people spoken about it it's happened in some people's life and the uk government it was fine but could have been better since the way they respond on the answers it was like not clear answers and uh, some of the government people was not friendly that much, but maybe they could, the tone could be rude, but they refer to your friend and they refer to the other colleague and the other colleague. And it's like, they kept doing that. So you can't get direct answer, but it was fine. That was good because they felt the pressure. Everybody could feel the pressure that day, especially during the conference itself. It was even through silence. You could feel like there's a tension between the committee, the UN committee and the UK government, which wasn't bad. It feels like we had the upper hand and even the chair himself was proud about it. He's, he was so happy about that kind of conference he had this year. To be honest, I will say that clearly because that's my point of view. I see yes, because everybody deserves to live equally. And the amount of young people we have, they have consistency and they commit every day to come. Even like sometimes they, let's say they doesn't show up for some reason, but there's challenges, mental health challenges, life obstacles, maybe having a bad day, but all that counts. And they still come. They do their best every single day, which is good. So excellent for me. At least someone want to come and change his life. Just do everything differently. It's that was an education, mentally, physically, on any aspect. So yeah, I would love to see more young people in that kind of experience and live more better than I did. Even by like 10 times, I'll be more happy. I don't mind it. Exactly, I don't mind it. That's why I choose that job in the first place. So that was my answers to all the questions. And thank you all for your time. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Genevieve McCollum, and I represented the Northern Ireland Youth Forum as a NI delegate to the UNCRC in Geneva this year. As a member of NOIF's Elephant Coming Out of the Dark Mental Health Steering Group, I used my 30 second time slot to speak about mental health. I explained to the committee the extent of the CAMS waiting lists and how high suicide rates are in NI comparison to the rest of the UK. I also mentioned how living in a post-conflict society in Northern Ireland means that there is intergenerational trauma contributing to the mental health epidemic. I also answered questions from the committee on sectarian and cyberbullying and relationships in sexuality education, which has now been acknowledged as a key issue by the Secretary of State of NI, which we as secondary students should be entitled to. I'm so proud of myself and all the young people involved for speaking truth to power, and it's so amazing to see the impacts of young people and people in power listening to Youth Voice. And that is reflected in the concluding observations that we're going to discuss today. I am really grateful for the acknowledgement of RSA, and I hope that all the other recommendations we made will someday be acknowledged in the same way. Thank you.
We'll start off with um, any questions from the group on participation and knowledge of rights. If anyone with those questions would like to come up to the microphone, please do. Uh, so our first question is, uh, we think that schools should have a national school policy, national school council policy, and every school should have a school council or a people forum. This should be held accountable during school inspections. What do you think? And our second question is, do you think schools should have a rights club? And our final question is, do you and your colleagues know and talk about children's rights? So we could probably start with Lindsay, seeing was to do with education. That's the first question. Up oh, later, right, yeah. Or I can get up, whichever. <coughs> okay, everybody. Well, firstly, thank you very much for those questions. I think they're really, really excellent questions. Um, for those of you who don't know me, I'm Lindsay Farrell, Deputy Secretary in the Department of Education. And these issues are actually really timely for, for us at the minute. So in terms of the first question around school councils, we know there's a lot of schools that, that do have school councils, um, but we also recognise that oftentimes young people tell us they either don't really know about their school councils or they don't feel they're really effective in terms of reflecting their voice or giving them a voice to speak into decision making within the school. So I think your idea of there being a policy around school councils is a really good one. It's something we would need to take back to the department and give some thought to. There is a project that is underway being led by DE just around the participation of young people in decision making. And that's something that we're looking at, at how we can set, I suppose, a format for that that's really effective and meaningful for young people, but that works across departments. I think when it comes to schools, um, it's certainly something that we can think about. In terms of the ETI and it being built into inspection, again, I think that's a really good idea. I have to be honest, I had never thought of that. Um, I know the ETI are currently developing their new inspection model. Um, and I know one of the things that they will look at is participation and influence and youth voice within that. So that's certainly something I'll bring back to the department um, and we'll look at. I think in terms of you know, what young people often told us and I've read in the report is that there can be a difference between primary and post-primary in terms of children and young people feeling their voices are heard. And so I think there is something more that we need to look at around how we can be a bit more intentional around that. So, so thank you for those points and I'll certainly bring them back. Do you want me to answer the, the other two as well or just the one around school councils? Well, the next one is to do, do you think schools should have a rights club? Yeah, again, I think the whole point about, and again, young people have said through this work that, that they don't often feel they're as aware as they could be or made aware as they could be through school in terms of the rights that they have. I think there's a real opportunity for us in DE through the children's right impact assessment process. We've worked very closely um, with the Office of the Children's Commissioner around that. Um, so we've developed some training modules and the head of the civil service has written out to all departments about that. Now in terms of specific to schools, I think that's a way for us to go into schools and again have a conversation around awareness of rights and how schools can play a role within that. Um, I think there's really interesting perspectives because there's something there for curriculum, but there's also something around teacher professional learning and how teachers are equipped and supported to be able to do this type of thing in schools. So again, I think there's a lot there that we could look at through our participation project and certainly a lot that we could bring back into the department and give some further thought to. In terms of the, the third um, point, um, which is more generally about do our colleagues talk about children's rights? Again, I think the child's right impact assessments are really, really important tool for that. So before Christmas, the head of the civil service wrote to all departments about the training package around conducting children's right impact assessments. Um, we're doing some very specific work within the Department of Education around that at the minute, running out some training and a webinar for all staff, again, to raise awareness of this, but also to ensure that children's right impact assessment are actually a living, meaningful tool. So they don't just become a paper exercise, but that as colleagues are bringing forward new guidance 
or new policy areas that they're building that into the process. And one tangible example of that that we may come on to later is the recent publication of the statutory guidance consultation on restraint and seclusion that had the child's right impact assessment built into that. So I think, again, that's a really important mechanism. But I'm not going to lie to you. We're at the start of the road with that. But I think it's starting a really important conversation with colleagues within DE specifically around children's rights. Um, Gareth Johnston, Deputy Secretary at the Executive Office. Uh, I'm responsible for uh, community relations and inclusion policy. Um, just to echo what Lindsay's saying about uh, do we talk about, do we think about children's rights? Um, yes, we do, and I think we're doing it more and more, um, which is which is good and important. Um, at the minute, we have a, a child rights impact assessment on our budget and the budget pressures that we have this year, uh, which is out for, for consultation. Um, and I think going through that has been, and going through the training and so on, has been a learning process for the, for the department. Um, where I would like to shift thinking about uh, human rights and equality generally is to the early stages of policy making, um, when we're identifying what policy priorities we need to set, um, what options there are, what we want to focus on. Um, I think, to be honest, there can be a way in which these things are a bit of a, a checklist that gets ticked afterwards. Um, and if we can do something to, to front load that thinking um, so that rights really inform our priorities, um, that would be a, a step forward. On the rights clubs, um, I'm LGBT champion for the civil service um, and uh, I've been able to see in that role uh, some of the work that's being done on probably gay straight alliances, and what you're supposed to call them anymore, but you know, mm -hmm. uh, gay straight alliances in, in, in schools. Um, when we launched our civil service uh, LGBT staff network. Um, we had somebody come along from uh, Shimna Integrated College uh, and talk about the experience of uh, rights clubs there. Thank you, and thanks for your questions, Orla, isn't it? Y yeah. Olivia, sorry, Olivia, thank you. Um, yeah, look, really good questions, and um, the Schools Council's one I'm going to start with. Um, I've spent the last probably 15, 20 years of my, my career working on youth voice projects and Article 12 is probably one of the most important articles in the convention for me because young people's voices are so important. I can remember when Kula started in office as the, the last commissioner. Um, my last workplace, the Northern Ireland Youth Forum, done some work with Nikki on schools councils and one of the big things that young people said then was that the circular that was in place wasn't strong enough and they wanted a policy. So I would agree that a policy is needed. But I think it goes further than that actually. We've, we lobbied for a long time for a youth assembly and it's brilliant that members of the youth assembly are here today, but that was a long time. That was, that was a lobby that took 15 years, maybe 13, 14, 15 years. So I think we need to go deeper. We need to resource all the, the seven organisations that are here today are all involved in youth participation. So you're participating in school, you're doing it in your community, um, and that takes time and it takes resources to make it meaningful. So I think there's a big bit of work to be done, and, and it links to the other things that you talked about, actually, around rights clubs. So I, th I think knowledge of rights, I'm going to talk about under your second two questions. So one thing is about educating young people about their rights. And the other thing is about educating our decision makers, including the four people you see here in front of you, about young people's rights and the, important, the importance of that and what we can do in our roles to influence others. Um, so in terms of rights clubs and schools, I'm asking myself questions about do children and young people know about Nikki? Do they know about rights? How many people in this room knew about the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child before coming into this line of work. And I think for lots of children and young people, we, they don't know enough. And if you don't know your rights, then how can you exercise them? Um, and especially for those young people who are most discriminated against. So I'm really passionate actually about how we educate young people. And that should happen in schools, absolutely. It should be part of the curriculum. Um, and it needs to happen in communities and in, in every other part of our life. Um, 
I can update you as well, and Ken, please keep me right here. Uh, not even a week in, in the office, but uh, Nikki are doing work with governments locally and centrally in terms of educating decision makers and working with civil servants and, and others. Um, and that's, I, I believe, we have come a long way. We really have the past uh, 20 years in terms of youth participation. We've come a long, long way, um, but we've lots more work to do. So thank you for those questions, and hopefully I've answered them in a way that was understandable. Thank you. Thank you, Rose. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Ryan Henderson. I'm one of the Assistant Chief Constables at the Police Service of Northern Ireland. So it's, it's brilliant to be here today with you all, because um, it's easy to feel a bit grumpy at the moment with there being no assembly and uh, with the impact of budget cuts. And actually, being at such a positive event uh, is a really nice thing to do uh, with people so positively engaged around promoting rights and awareness of rights uh, and to see you all so committed to that and interested in that is fantastic. Um, you know, the Police Service in Northern Ireland when it was created was created to be a human rights based police service. Um, probably unique in the world in that sense and unique in the world also that it had a code of ethics right from the start with human rights at the start of it. So for me it's one of the things I'm really proud of about being in the police service in Northern Ireland is that human rights is really at the heart of the decisions that we take. Um, and children's rights have to be there um, right at the heart of that. Um, and sometimes it's hard to hear those voices. Um, you know, we're a service that is democratically accountable, um, but we have to work really hard to hear voices that don't get heard. And young people's voices, I would argue, don't get heard loudly enough in shaping how we go about our policy, how we go about our practice how we go about our day-to-day -day policing. Um, there have been, I think, some really good, interesting bits of progress, I guess, in the last, particularly over the last five and six years. Um, we've done a lot of work, and, and this just, Olivia, trying to get to your point around, do police officers, do police staff, how often do we think about young people's rights? Where does it feature for us in terms of, of what we prioritize? Um, we did a really good programme of training around adverse childhood experiences, which every officer gets when they come through the doors of the police college. Um, and with different levels of that for those that work in public protection, those that work in much more closely with young people um, at risk of harm, uh, to really try and do just that, to open people's minds to the thought that what's been presented to me on the doorsteps not really what's going on here. Um, recently, we have with um, education partners and health partners um, launched Up and Compass, which is all about trying to support young people who are in homes where they are suffering from domestic abuse. You know, a young person sat at the top of the stairs witnessing their parents in an abusive relationship uh, is, is traumatic and, and affects them as deeply as it does their parents. We want to make sure that when they go to school in the morning, uh, that their teachers know so they can give them the support that they need in a way that's supportive. They're not asking awkward questions, but they've got the information that they need to, be able to help that young person uh, in the morning go about what it, you know, a normal life as possible as they can in that. Um, one of the sad things, I guess, around the recent austerity and budget cuts is policing used to be able to do so much in terms of projects and programmes with young people through police and community safety partnerships work through sporting associations and work with schools. Uh, and where we have seen that start to reduce, and um, services reduce to very much their kind of core responsibilities, makes me sad, I have to say, because some of that opportunity and that engagement, um, particularly young people in school settings and outside of school settings in the evening, just a great opportunity to kind of bust myths, work together, uh, and open those doors to those really good conversations um, that I think you're, you're talking about there, Olivia, in terms of how much do we as a public body think about young persons' um, rights? But I can assure you from my perspective and those I work with, rights is what kind of is the heart of the decisions that we make. Uh, wanting to engage with our communities, of which young people are a key part, is a top priority for, for the police service. Uh, and we'll continue to do that despite some of the challenges that we, uh, that we face. Thanks. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Maeve. We came to the conclusion that the unhealed generational trauma has impacted the political system and education for young people. Many young people have not been fully educated on the troubles 
So how can we simultaneously ensure our generation and the future generations are educated without political bias in order to ensure we can look to the future and move on? Why are we on par for a political system that is fueled by people, that has been failed for people for over 100 years? And why is fake peace permitted to the media and international organisations? Thank you. So I think we'll start with Gareth on that one. Um, I'll, uh, I'll, I'll let Lindsay say something more about the education aspects. Um, but I think you, you've captured something very important when you talk about the transgenerational trauma um, that, that, that we've experienced here. Um, the uh, former victims commissioner, I remember, was very uh, vocal about this. Uh, she said, we tend to think about the troubles in terms of uh, victims, in terms of people who were there at the time, uh, in terms of people who suffered physically, mentally. Uh, but actually, there is a whole community trauma um, that's there and that, that, that's being passed down. Um, and I honestly think when we look at uh, social issues, even when we look at, at economic issues, um, I was at a, a seminar recently when we were looking at some of the comparisons between the economy here uh, and the economic opportunities in, in the South. Um, there's about a 20 percentage point gap in productivity. Uh, and when you ask the question why, uh, some of that, even in economic terms, um, has to be about the, the legacy of the, the troubles. Um, so, uh, what can we do about it? Uh, first of all, I think we can be uh, honest about it and acknowledge that that is there and that's something that has to be tackled. Uh, you hear more and more within government uh, recognition of the need for trauma-informed practice, uh, whether that's in health services, in, in education, um, in how we deliver all kinds of, of services uh, where you come across the, the legacy of the troubles. So um, we need to name it. Uh, we need to think about how we make our services and our policies uh, trauma-informed, and that involves hearing from people who've been uh, affected. Um, the other uh, issue that's very current uh, that I think is relevant to this is how we think about peace and how we think about peacetime. Uh, it's easy to think about peace simply as an absence of violence, um, but actually there's much more to it. And, and, and the phrase positive peace um, is one that has been uh, coming up recently in our conversations with the political parties, in our conversations about the future uh, programme for government. Um, and, uh, and it's about what does a genuinely peaceful and post-conflict society look like across a whole range of measures, not just non-violence, um, but areas like mental health and, uh, and well-being. In the executive office, uh, a department that uh, maybe people think is mostly about what goes on up in Stormont Castle and supporting the executive ministers, that's very important. But in the executive office, we, we drew this wonderful wiring diagram. It's called the Sankey diagram. Um, look up uh, Sankey, who was, a, who was an engineer. Um, and we listed the things that we do down the left-hand side, and we listed uh, the uh, objectives, the outcomes that were in the uh, program for government, the draft program for government on the other side. And from that, we came to the conclusion that actually our job as the executive office, as this kind of central department within government, is about well-being uh, and about promoting well-being and about building well-being. So I think some of the um, language that you're talking about being very much reflected in government and in our, in our policy making. Maeve, thank you very much for, uh, for the questions um, and I completely agree with everything that, that Gareth has said. I think if you look at our society 25 years on, it's very easy for us to become maybe frustrated 
and a bit downhearted when, when we look around us. But I think sometimes when we take a step back and we look at those 25 years, we can say during that time, peace has been made, which, as Gareth has said, can often be equate to an absence of violence, which, relatively speaking, we do in comparative terms to where we were before that. But it's about getting beyond that, isn't it, as Gareth has just said, to peace building and really embedding it in a way that means people can feel it and can feel the real benefits of it. Because I think the issue across many parts of our community is that there are groups of people and there are communities of people who don't really feel any better off as a result of this, this peace that everyone else seems to talk about. And I think that is a real challenge for us across departments about how we can make the benefits of peace more real and much more than Gareth has said just about the absence of violence. And I think the voice of young people is really critical in all of that and that education has such an important role to play in all of that. But Maeve, as your question suggested, there is a sense from young people who are always telling us that you don't feel that you're adequately taught about these things within school and that there's a gap in what you're taught in terms of what happened in this place that we live in. And I suppose um, I would have seen that reflected in some conversations that I've had with teachers and with schools around it who maybe think it's just a bit sensitive or it's just a bit close to home. And so it's easier to talk about what happened in the lead up to the Second World War. And it's easier to talk about the Russian Revolution because those things are much further back in time and they're much further away in terms of distance. So I think there is a real challenge for schools around this. There is flexibility within our curriculum for it to be taught, but I think it does come down to teachers feeling confident and equipped to be able to do that. I'm aware of many excellent programs that were developed through former peace programs, for example, that actually were getting into the nitty gritty of what happened in this place, what reconciliation means, and what that positive peace looks like going forward. But I would say they haven't been at a system level. So it has depended maybe on the school that you're in or the particular teacher that you have. So it is something that we do need to grapple with. There are very live conversations going on between ourselves and the department. Executive office colleagues are involved. And SIA that develops all of the resources that are used in your schools to support the curriculum around actually how can we better equip teachers and give them the confidence and the resources that they need to have these conversations with you. And also trust you as young people to be able to receive this information and to have those really important conversations and discussions around it. Because I think for us to move forward in a real, genuine way, we need to have those conversations. And you're such a really important part of it. The second aspect that you mentioned, Maeve, was around that sense of transgenerational trauma. And I think, as Gareth has said, increasingly across all departments, we are talking more about trauma and how it has been passed down through generations and through communities. And we certainly see that now today in our schools. And we're hearing a lot more about it and we're talking a lot more about it. So again, we're doing a lot of thinking at the minute around what does a trauma-informed education system look like? How do we build an understanding that for you to have experienced trauma doesn't mean you have to have experienced one traumatic event? It may have come from the family you've grown up in or the community you've grown up in and the experiences that you've had. And so how do we build our teacher training around that? How do we um, support resources around that? That needs us to change our whole system to become that trauma-informed. So this is not a, a quick fix. There's a lot of work to be done around it. But I would say there's a growing movement across government departments about the need for us to recognise it and to do something about it. Uh, thanks. Um, I suppose I'll talk less as, as Ryan the policeman and probably more Ryan the dad. Um, 
I mean, if I think back, so I was born in 1974, so really when the Troubles was starting to be at its worst and then, you know, brought up through um, education and schooling through through the Troubles. And, and if I think back to my life, and I'm sure the others in the panel will be the similar, you know, going into school and your bus being stopped and checked. Uh, I went to school in North Belfast and, um, you know, search sometimes before you go into school or search and you go into Belfast and, and you would just see the visible... Uh, element of the, the troubles all around you, you know, it wouldn't have been unusual to go into Belfast and hear, uh, hear a bomb go off or, or hear a gun being shot. Um, so when I think about kind of my life compared to my kids' life, my kids are, are 20, 20 and uh, nine, or 17, it's kind of immeasurably different, you know, their opportunities are so much better than the opportunities that I would have had growing up in the, the troubles and I, I think it's probably important just to acknowledge uh, the lives that they have today compared to the life that I had um, coming up through the troubles are, uh, you know, are quite are, are are really very different, and I think that's to be celebrated. Um, Northern Ireland is the safest place in the UK. Uh, any statistic you look at would tell you that, and that's a really good news story for the economy and for our general sense of health and well-being. I probably we don't talk about it enough. Um, we have a, you know, a lot less knife crime, we have a lot less availability of uh, some of the really nasty drugs that you would see last, uh, around in part, other parts of the UK and the US with a lot less burglary, etc. But that's not to say that it's not far from perfect in parts and our peace is not far from perfect in parts. And there are certain parts of Northern Ireland through um, traditional uh, poverty, lack of investment, lack of infrastructure and support that do not feel the benefits that my kids are lucky enough to have had um, because simply where life's DNA lottery is meant they've ended up being born. Um, so I think for me that is the a critical element. There was so much good work done through neighbourhood renewal and other programmes to really uh, look at those areas and locations and try so hard to lift them in a way that would give opportunities and I think we've slipped off somewhere in that in terms of how we do that collaboratively um, and uh, that's a really important bit I think of really cementing a positive piece um, which is I think what we, we really need here in, in Northern Ireland and it is really tough to speak of the past in a way that um, can, can, will not leave, leave some feeling it's either a sensitive issue or that's not my past, that's your past. Um, it takes really wise minds, I think, to plot a way through that and it's not easy to do. Um, but uh, I think we have to do it um, to help us to move, not forward, because that sounds like we want to leave it behind, we don't, but to understand it, to learn the lessons and to be able to talk comfortably about it, because for me that says that we start to understand it and we've started to process the trauma in a way that's allowing us to, uh, to be positive. Thank you, and Maeve, what a brilliant question. I think we could have a whole seminar on it. And if Duncan Morrow were still here, I'm not sure if he still is, I'm sure Duncan would be very happy that you've asked that question. There's so much that I want to talk about here, but I'm going to try and crystallise it as best I can. I'm looking around this room and I'm, I'm seeing young people that I've had the privilege to work with. And one of my dear friends over here, Sophia, Sophia, Sophia spoke about this issue in a recent meeting I was at. Sophia is 14 and from Brasheen. And she shared her experiences in a meeting that I was recently at about what life is like growing up in this divided society. And I have to say, she blew all of her minds. But what Sophia was saying to me and to the, her peers in that room is that young people have a lot to say about this. Young people are telling us time and time again, we want to talk about this. We want to be part of the solution. And I love living here. I love this place that I come from. But there are some really... Um, negative statistics that I'm going to try and, from memory, uh, repeat to you. So, across the UK, this is the most deprived part of the UK, 37, I think around 37% of people here live in deprived areas, and that, that is compared to, in England, about 20% of people, and in Wales, 22%, I think, right? So, something like that. We have one in four children living here in poverty. We have the highest mental ill health rates in the UK, and Ireland, I think possibly Ireland as well. Um, President Biden stood right here, not so long ago, talking about 25 years of the Good Friday Agreement. Ten years ago, President Obama and his wife 
spoke at the Waterfront Hall and Michelle Obama said that leadership is about stepping out of your comfort zone. And I remember those words. And I think that's what we need our leaders to do. We need our leaders to get back into government, actually, first of all, and step outside of their comfort zones. Um, and I just wanted to mention as well, with, with two people here beside me from the Executive Office and the Department for Education, and those two departments do lots of great work in terms of the legacy of the past. We'll have TBOC, we'll have um, Central Good Relations Unit funding that our, the voluntary sector has benefited from. DE are doing their best every day in school. Every day you hear school budgets cut, education authority budgets cut. cut. I would call on the Westminster government, as it says in the concluding OBS, withdraw the Northern Ireland budget, A. Eh? And the second thing for me would be relook at how, how they fund, how we receive our funding. Because this is this wee part of the UK um, has a lot of our, our own very specific issues that, that I would argue that we need additional support to grapple with. And one of those issues, Maeve, is the one that you've asked us about. It's, it's that big issue of the legacy of our past and dealing with transgenerational trauma. The last thing I would like to say, and I think it's been touched upon, is for me it's about early intervention. It's about talking about these things in school, in preschool, from a very early age, support, wrapping support around children and young people with regards to their well-being and their, their mental health and coping skills and all of those things. So maybe it's a really good question and I think we should delve more into it, but I don't want to, I don't want to take up more time and thank, thank you for asking it. Thank you. Good afternoon. So um, I have two questions for you. Um, the first is, um, how can you amend the LLW curriculum to more accurately reflect the needs of students to learn about key issues surrounding RSE, mental health and rights education to the end of reducing discrimination within schools as far as possible? I would also like to ask, what are you doing to ensure all young people are meeting their full potential, particularly with regard to issues like rural education and academic selection? Thank you. Now, Lindsay, I'd be guessing you'd be interested in answering that one. Thank you very much, and, and thank you for, for the question. Um, in terms of the, the first one, um, as I think was, was noted in some of the, the introductory comments earlier um, in this session, um, RSE has been a huge issue um, and has received a lot of public commentary over, over recent times. Um, over and above that, the Northern Ireland Human Rights um, Commission produced a report and the Education and Training Inspectorate also produced an evaluation around the preventative curriculum after having received responses from in and around 14,000 young people. So the first thing I would say is I completely understand how big an issue this is for you as young people because you've told us time and time again. Um, and we know there are very strong views along a continuum and that is why it is such a tricky subject um, for us all to chart our way through. You'll all be well aware that the Secretary of State has intervened um, on a specific, a very specific element of this and he has asked the department to bring forward regulations and to produce guidance for schools by the 1st of January 2024 in relation to key uh, stages three and four, um, to produce age appropriate, comprehensive, a scientifically accurate curriculum content around sexual and productive health and rights and early pregnancy and access to abortion services. So that is the very, very specific nature of the legislation brought forward by the Secretary of State. And the department's currently out to consultation on that. You'll all be very aware of that. I think the closing date for it is the 24th of November. I would really encourage you to respond to that. I would also throw out the offer, we're very happy to talk to you as young people around that. I have had a number of engagements with young people around this specific issue through the Northern Ireland Youth Assembly and other opportunities, but I would be very happy to talk to any group in more detail around this specific issue. We know that even though the Secretary of State's legislation is very specific to that particular point, we know there are broader issues around RSE. 
Um, and so we will be writing out to schools in the guidance, reminding them of their obligations in terms of the existing statutory uh, curriculum that there is to deliver, that there is a requirement on schools as it currently stands, both to deliver RSE, usually that is as part of learning for life and work, but also to consult with parents and with young people in the development of that RSE policy. So every school is required to have an RSE policy as things currently exist, and to consult with parents and children and young people in the development of that RSA policy. So again, we'll be reminding the schools of that. In terms of the development of the guidance, um, that's very much a work in progress. We have to have that in place for the 1st of January 2024. And there are things we need to tease out within that around the opt-out. So you'll be aware that the Secretary of State had built within the legislation um, an opt-out um, for parents we are seeking legal advice around how that extends and how that is balanced with the rights of yourselves as children and young people. So those are issues we are teasing out and exploring um, with the legal advice. Um, as part of that, we also need to understand how we can monitor what's happening in schools, because part of the difficulty that we are in in the education system, you'll be aware of the current industrial relations issues. Um, so the teaching unions are an action short of strike, which means they are not complying with inspection. So our usual way of getting assurance in the department around delivery of the curriculum, around the provision of quality education, was through our education and training inspectorate and inspectors going into schools and inspecting the practice that they see. That is not happening because of the industrial relations. And I'm not making any judgment around that. You know, teachers have a have a legitimate right to seek um, higher salaries, and that is what they're doing, but I'm just laying out that's the factual position and where it is quite difficult to get the assurance then in terms of what's happening in schools in terms of practice. There was also another really important issue came through in both the human rights work and in the ETI work, and that was that teachers didn't feel skilled or confident around RSE. So part of what we'll be looking at in terms of development of the guidance and also in the development of the resources that SIA will be bringing forward is how teachers will be trained in the delivery of those resources. So hopefully that covers off the, the first part of, of your question. In terms of the, the second part, um, academic selection is something, um, it is a reality uh, across our society. For that to change, um, that would require the assembly and the executive to be in place because that would have to require a cross-party agreement for academic selection um, to be removed. Um, the basis of our education system is that children are educated in line with the wishes of their parents. Um, that's the fundamental cornerstone um, of how education is delivered in this part of the world. And so for at the minute, um, that is in place, that if parents wish their child um, to be educated um, in using that selective route through the grammar system, and that's all completely lawful. But for that to change, we would need the assembly and the executive to be back. Um, it's also important to say we do have the independent review of education. Um, I'm not sure if any young people have had the opportunity to engage with them. They're just concluding their work. Um, we're hoping that they will report in the autumn. Uh, we don't know what recommendations that they may make, but we do look to that independent review in terms of what it's going to say about the future direction of our education system. So hopefully that, that answers your question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Can we now have the group on mental health to come up and ask their questions? If you don't mind, I would like to uh, you to answer a quick yes or no uh, question before I ask you the questions. Do you think you, young people's mental health is important? Um, so the questions I'd like to ask is, why is mental health the first thing affected by budget cuts? Um, if there's mandatory physical education with no exam, why is there not mandatory mental health education? And what support is available for young people who don't meet the threshold for CAMS but still need support? Thank you. 
And is there anyone in particular who would like to take out take those questions? Lindsay, you look quite eager. Yes. Relevant to me, but I don't want to do all the talking. Yeah. Thank you very much for, for your question, and I think we all completely agree that mental health is hugely important. Um, I think an awful lot of work has been done over recent years to remove the stigma around it, which is really, really positive. But that now needs to be backed up in terms of a longer term approach to it um, because of the issues that we're seeing. Um, there's been a few references throughout the event today about the, the budget settlement. Um, and unfortunately, one of the consequences of the education budget settlement was uh, the conclusion of the Healthy Happy Minds pilot, primary school counselling pilot. That was a slightly different set of circumstances in that that was a pilot that was due to come to an end at the end of March. So within that budget settlement, there was no other decision possible other than just not to continue that pilot. I would give you some reassurance. We have been evaluating that pilot. We're finalising the evaluation report of it. And we will be taking the learning because even though we know it did a lot of really, really important early intervention with primary school children, we also know there were a lot of issues in terms of how it was rolled out and how it was delivered that we need to learn from. I think um, more broadly, we are we're actually still continuing to support a lot of work around mental health. Um, so you'll be aware of the joint DE and Department of Health, Emotional Health and Wellbeing framework. So within that, we've been able to continue the support for the RISE initiative for four to 11 year olds um, going into primary schools. Again, looking at that early intervention, the EA Youth Service Reach program that's working with six to 19 year olds. And if you're in the 11 to 19 category, everyone has the opportunity to avail of the text and nurse service within school. So those are all supported through that framework. Um, we're also hoping throughout the remainder of this year to introduce two new elements, which are the being well, doing well, uh, EA work going into schools to develop whole school approaches to health and well-being. And then there's a health-led emotional well-being in schools program that is in all post primary schools. So we are continuing to support a lot of initiatives, but we also believe there's more we need to do. And I think it's along the lines of the question that you've asked. Um, I, had, I recently visited a school in London and it called itself a well-being school. And that school taught me a lot actually in the day I was there. They treated um, mental health and well-being in the same way that they treated literacy and numeracy. So it was, a, a, it was a pillar of their curriculum that they delivered every day in their classroom, maybe not overtly, but it was included and they treated it as seriously as they did literacy and numeracy. So I think there's a lot we can learn about how we actually embed emotional health and well-being to build um, resilience in children and young people from the earliest of age. Um, to equip them with the strategies and techniques that they need and to recognise the difference between what is a feeling that is natural and you can deal with yourself and when you need help from others. And then we need to ensure that help from others is in place, whether that's through the primary school counselling. And we also need to look at the counselling provided in post-primary. So just to give you some reassurance, we're looking at this at, as a continuum, right from your in the early years, right through to post-primary. We recently held a workshop with young people to give us their views. And I think I recognise some people from the room that were maybe at that telling us about their experience of being in school and we want to do a lot more of that as we develop this going forward. There's a lot going on but I think there's a lot we can do better and we can plan in the longer term for. Hi, um, this is a question for Poverty. Is there anything that could be done to simplify school uniforms and stop schools from using expensive brands to support families in poverty? And then, and then on to policing. What is the justification for the age of criminal responsibility and is in any time frame this going to change in the UK? Thank you. Right, I think we best bring this to you and anyone else. 
Uh, yeah, thanks. Brilliant question and a really live one around the age of criminal responsibility. I guess from a policing perspective, um, we, uh, it's really important to us that young people aren't criminalised uh, and we would see um, you know, on a daily basis uh, that when, when young people come into the criminal justice system, um, it's, uh, it's not a great thing for them. Uh, it can start to reduce their uh, opportunities and their, their kind of life chances and uh, starts to close doors to them and that cannot be a good thing um, for our society, for those young people. Um, not my job to set the, the age of criminal responsibility, it's the, the will of Parliament um, has done it and there's a lot of um, very important lobbying uh, around trying to look at the, the age uh, of that. Um, you know, you asked me at a kind of personal level, um, you know, do I think a 10-year-old, uh, for example, um, is able to make good choices, evidence-based, consequence-aware decisions around things that they take? I'm not sure that's right all the time. Uh, and therefore to say that uh, in terms of the law, the decisions that they take at that time should be seen in the same way as they are for an adult, for example, making those same decisions or making those same choices. So I think it's a really important debate to have uh, and I'm, you know, brilliant that you're also actively involved in it. Uh, and certainly from the police's perspective, we don't want to see young people criminalised. We don't want to see young people in the justice system because uh, that's a failure on all of our parts uh, if that happens. Um, of course, the law is there to protect our citizens and from time to time young people will um, step across the line, break the law and harm others uh, and policing the justice system will become involved in that. Um, but I think it's really important that actually together we kind of set what is a reasonable bar in terms we start, we start to think criminal responsibility, what's an appropriate age uh, for that for, for a young person, absolutely an important debate. Um, not sure you want to state on poverty, Chris? Thank you, and yeah, another really important um, issue. And I did, I did touch on poverty actually in, in the last question, and I think for me, in my new role as commissioner, poverty will be probably the biggest issue. I think I think everything else is really important. You know, there are so many issues that young people and we all care about, but for me, poverty kind of exacerbates and, and trumps a lot of those issues. So the issues about uniforms and, in fact, the hidden the hidden costs of education is maybe something we need to talk about more. You know, a lot of schools are really under pressure with budgets and they're asking parents for contributions for lots of different things. Um, so it's probably something that we do need to talk about more. The issue of uniforms, I have my own opinions about. Uh, and my two kids who are here somewhere definitely are anti-uniform. I don't know if they're here. I think they're exploring somewhere. But uh, are they right there? <laughs> Nisha and Kieran. But I would, I'd like to ask you, actually. I, th I think what's important for me is to listen to the views of young people. And maybe just a wee bit of participation here. A show of hands, right? Um, if you think we should not be compelled to wear school uniforms, if you wouldn't mind putting your hand up. So, okay, right, I'm not going to count. And then those who vote to keep school uniforms, put your hand up. So, yeah, with a majority, I think that was a majority of no school uniform, was it? But for me, it's important to listen to children and young people about these issues. I know some parents will have different opinions on this because uh, what I've heard is that, you know, if, if you don't have a uniform, then... There may be issues about the clothes that you wear to school and brands and all that kind of stuff. Um, but for me, it's about listening to the voices of young people on that issue. And I think the underlying thing here for me is about poverty, actually. I did say in my earlier answer that one in four children live in poverty. Something like 30% of our community, our, the people here, are living in deprived areas. Um, and it shouldn't be. You know, it's, the, the slogan that's widely used now is poverty is a political choice. And I, I personally believe in that. I think we can we can do more about how we spend our money, how we use our money here, um, how our our government can have more powers with regards to money. But yeah, poverty is a huge issue, and the uniform question is a huge debate. 
So hopefully I've answered that, okay. Thank you, and could we now have a group on experience of care to ask their questions? Young people feel that there should be support for all young people up to the age of 25, regardless of education. Why is it not possible for all care experienced young people to receive the support? Um, both teachers and pupils don't understand what care is. We face a stigma of people saying we're orphans or rejects because there isn't enough education. Can we have something like this for schools so they can understand care? Coming into care is very scary. We need better explanations and more child-friendly explanations. The police can move us in the middle of the night and we don't feel listened to. What can you do to make us feel safe and listened to? There is not enough awareness of care, so how can we get good foster cares when they don't know? Can you do positive advertising to take away the stigma? Thanks. Is there anyone in particular you'd like to ask a question? Chris? Thank you for your questions um, and thank you for sharing your experiences. Um, I'm not care experienced, so I don't have I, I don't have the same lived experience, but I do try my best to understand. Um, and your first question there was about support for young people up to 25. Personally, again, this isn't necessarily the view of my office. I don't know yet, but personally, I think that support should go on longer because um, we often talk about the the golden thread, you know, the, the support that young people need in their lives from an early age right through to early adulthood, facing all these different transitions. I believe strongly that that support needs to be there. Um, some other countries are buying into a thing called the Barnahas model, um, and it, it was referenced by the um, UN committee in February, and that's a model whereby young people are provided with support that wraps around them. Um, so that they don't have to retell their story over and over and over again, so that their support needs are met um, from the earliest stage. Um, and that model is something that I'd like to learn more about and try to implement here. Um, I think it's really important that young people's voices are listened to. Um, as I say, I, I don't have the lived experiences that you have, um, but I do know from my own experiences in this, in my own work, that often young people's voices are lost and they're not listened to and decisions are made for them, um, not by them. Um, so I believe strongly that young people's voices need to be front and centre um, of all of those, all of those experiences um, and that young, young people, they need to be, they need to be front and centre. Um, so yeah, I don't know if any other panellists would like to add, but I just want to thank you for your questions and I suppose reassure you that from my perspective your voices are central and that that support for me should go beyond the age of 25 actually. Firstly thank you very much for, for sharing and, and um, like Chris I don't have that lived experience either so I can't pretend to understand what that's like but that's why people like me need to listen and need to ask the questions of, of people like you. So thank you for that. Um, what I would say is we uh, support the Education Authority to set up a Children Looked After service and um, within there, um, and they roll out that service to schools um, that have children that are looked after within their care, within the, the schools. Um, they very much take a trauma-informed approach and they train the teachers in the schools and raise awareness. But there maybe is something about how we can do that more broadly and roll that out more um, to ensure that the people are more generally aware of the issues and that the stigma can be removed around this and a greater understanding. So that's certainly something I can take back and we can look at in terms of that service that, that we support through the Education Authority. And I think it links back to what we were chatting about earlier, about that trauma-informed approach. 
because if a truly trauma-informed approach is taken within schools and across educational settings, regardless of whether you're a child in care or a child looked after or whatever your circumstances are, they will always start with the child first and the needs and the experiences. Um, and so that's ultimately where we would want to get to. But thank you again. Now can we hear from our final group on the topic of disability? Uh, I would just like to say thank you for being here all today. Um, my name is Jessica Lisa McArdle and my questions are, could it be mandatory that any retailer or shop selling school uniforms must, be, must also be provided items that are sensory friendly adapted to physical needs and gender neutral. Um, the second question is, more outside organisations coming up into primary and secondary schools delivering PE classes, these are not often in inclusive and they put more pressure on classroom assistance. Why is this not being monitored? My last and final question is, some special schools are not allowing pupils to choose GCSE classes they are taking. For example, some pupils being made to take he HE and ICT. How can we take this away of the anatomy from the school? Thank you so much. Again, anyone in particular? Okay. I could take the second. Yeah, no problem. So thank you, Jess, for your, for your questions. Um, in terms of the, the second two parts of, of your question, um, Yes, we are aware there's a lot of schools that, that bring in external providers to support um, the delivery of um, PE or physical activity. Um, that is ultimately down to the structure of our education system, which as you will know, every school is run by a board of governors. And so uh, delivery of the curriculum in that school and bringing in external providers ultimately rests with the leadership of that school. Now that is something the ETI would look at when they come in and inspect a school. They look at that sort of delivery. But what I can tell you is that we recently had commissioned the ETI to do an evaluation specifically of PE. Um, so it, that was at a time when it was able to get into a number of schools and, and get a sample in terms of practice that was going on. There were some issues did come through that evaluation in terms of third party providers coming in and some of the practice that was happening. So I'm certainly happy to take that specific point back because that isn't one that we'd heard just around how inclusive it is for children with disabilities. So that's certainly something I can take back because we have set up a, a group specifically to look at PE within the department. So that's an issue I can take back and, and we can look at. In terms of the issue around special schools, um, you'll all be aware there's a lot of challenges at the minute in terms of special educational needs. We have just started a review in the department around special educational needs and one of the particular areas of focus within that review is curriculum support for children with special educational needs because our vision in DE is that every child is happy learning and succeeding. That applies to all children regardless of whether you have a special educational need or a disability. And so we need to be assured that those children are getting the same opportunities in terms of access to curriculum and how that's delivered. But it's maybe something that we need to, to talk to you a wee bit more about just to understand what exactly your concerns are. Is it around special schools or is it around specialist classes that are set up in mainstream schools? Or is it around children with special educational needs in mainstream not been able to access? So I think it's one, I think a follow-up conversation would be helpful around just for us to understand. And it is very, very timely because we're looking at, at everything in terms of special educational needs at the minute. So maybe that's something we can loop back through CLC around to, to get that set up. Just more generally on, on disability. Um, there is certainly a focus um, in the executive office uh, at the minute on how we uh, can support 
uh, as an executive can support people with disabilities. There is a, an awful phrase um, which is economic inactivity uh, and, and the number of people who uh, are economically inactive, in other words, not part of the labour market. Now, we recognise that in a lot of cases that is because people haven't been appropriately supported, um, had the right services to be able to make their contribution um, in whatever way that that is. Um, so uh, the services that we can provide for people with disabilities, you're kind of transitioning uh, out of school, uh, into education, into other activities, uh, very much part of the uh, agenda. Uh, and it's important that we hear those experiences and it's important that we respond to them. We're, we're talking at the moment um, about the, the missions uh, that an incoming executive would have. Um, one of those is about people, one about prosperity, one about our planet, um, and, uh, and how we uh, enable people of, of all abilities um, to contribute to those is, is absolutely on the agenda. Um, Maybe just since this was the last question, if I might be allowed a, a final word about participation of uh, children and, and young people. Um, I've had recent experience of being able to see that through uh, the Northern Ireland Youth Forum uh, and through meeting with the forum for uh, a discussion on a range of issues. Owen there was, was part of it and, and colleagues. Um, I've seen it too when in appointing the uh, Children's Commissioner. Uh, I was chairing that uh, appointment panel uh, and being able to bring young people, Ronan amongst them, um, into that panel. Um, I have to say, I wish I could have those youth representatives in all the panels I chair because the incisiveness um, of how they were able to identify you know, the strengths and weaknesses of, of candidates was, was really useful. Um, what am I saying? Keep in touch. Um, as Lindsay has said, um, we want to continue to engage. Uh, we in the executive office want to continue to engage as we shape uh, our refugee integration strategy, as we shape our racial equality strategy, um, as we, we shape the, the programme for government for the, the future. Um, and and you know, just a, a commitment from those of us on the panel um, that we will continue to uh, hear the concerns and the ideas that you want to bring uh, and reflect those up to, to ministers again when we have them um, and, and take account of those in making our plans and our policies. And finally we'll hear some concluding observations from Zoe. We started off with some really powerful testimonies from young people and their positive experiences engaging with the committee. We heard questions about young people knowing about their rights and student councils, generations learning about our past, transgenerational trauma. We heard about the concept of positive peace and what it looks like. We heard about leadership being outside our comfort zones. We heard time and time again that RSE is a huge issue for young people and offer from Lindsay for the Department of Education to speak um, directly to young people about so. We heard questions about academic selection and cuts to mental health education. We had a discussion about minimum age of criminal responsibility um, and the criminalisation of young people. We heard questions about how to support families by looking at the cost of school uniforms. We heard about supporting care leavers up to age 25 and training for schools on care and helping children feel safe. We heard about accessibility in schools um, and PE in schools and issues in special schools also. You may have noticed that the Department of Health were not able to join us today but they have offered a special session with young people um, on health issues. If interested, please let us know. And um, we hope you enjoy your day and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.